Um, again, uh, my name is David Packard. I'm the uh, chair of the Architectural Practice Community of Interest. And, uh, and I want to uh, welcome uh, those of you. I see lots of uh, names, very familiar names to me. Um, and I see a few new names. And I want to welcome everybody uh, to this uh, quarterly call. Um, we have the great pleasure of, of having uh, established this rhythm of a quarterly call um, over the last seven years, and it has been, uh, you know, it, it's, we, I guess we practiced social distancing before it was a thing. So, but we, I think we, uh, we uh, have an effective uh, means of communication with you all. And, and uh, so uh, without uh, further ado, I'm going to go through a quick, um, a quick business meeting this morning. Um, I would, uh, introduce uh, all the attendees, but um, with uh, 40 of us on the line, I think we'll, uh, we'll forego that for the moment. I'm glad to see so many people have registered and are participating. Um, so uh, next slide, please, Tamil. Um, I wanted to quickly uh, reiterate our mission statement. Um, from the beginning of our, the establishment of our community of interest, uh, we had three basic um, goals in mind. To, to promote architectural practice uh, within SAME, to broaden uh, SAME's exposure within the, the architectural community, uh, uh, to pro provide uh, networking and mentoring opportunities, and to celebrate, uh, and finally, we've added, added actually the celebration of excellence in public architecture. And um, for those of you that have seen the, uh, the journal, uh, the, we, I'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, we have announced the recipients of the uh, awards this year. And, um, and I'm quite excited about that whole process. I think it's been a, a great success. Next slide, please. Um, a quick, uh, maybe some quick reports from, from folks. I don't know if, uh, well, there's Ed right now. He just joined us. Uh, in, in, in line with our, our past uh, discussions, we've, uh, we've always given an opportunity for each of our vice chairs to, um, to give us a little update on, in terms of what is going on in their world. Ed, uh, do you have anything that you want to share with us in terms of AIA collaboration? Are you out there, Ed? I'm muted. Okay. Yep. Can you hear me? There you go. Thank you. I'm That's sorry. Right. Sorry, I'm slightly late. Uh, uh, we're going through the mil military programs. Uh, quarterly review, so something I'm sure David you tremendously. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in terms of coordination with AIA, what mostly I've been doing is been answering a lot of questions and providing information on the core's COVID response at this point. Certainly the standard designs that uh, that, that Huntsville developed through the medical uh, facility CX uh, I've shared those also in terms of other so sure, sort of like the daily uh, the daily daily slides that we now put out which summarizes our uh, our involvement it's been greatly appreciated by AIA uh, also David as you know that we uh, with Virgil Virgil and uh, with Bill Fountain over the past week or so about a proposal uh, I have sent that I have sent that out uh, to the SA to the same uh, health facilities work task force. We're going to see if we can work that. My intent is to be SAME to be the honest broker to set up some sort of meeting between us, AIA, and the other healthcare entities in there. One thing today, even our even engineering construction before was lamenting the fact is that. We have 43 districts that have responded to COVID, 43 different solutions, and they're still not very well coordinated. So, uh, 
So certainly the idea of how do we do a coordinated response, should we ever have to go through this uh, scenario again, is certainly great appreciated. Uh, I, have, I haven't heard back, but I will reach out again to uh, the Resilience Task Force at AIA, which is hand, and also heard COVID Task Force. We'll touch base with them. Um, otherwise, that's about all I have in terms of the AIA collaboration piece for now. I wanted to note, and you'll see in the in the, uh, the slide there that uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Darville will be uh, taking over for AIA collaboration uh, once Ed takes the reins as the uh, chair of this committee. So um, we welcome uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Hugh Darville from Huntsville Center, and uh, we look forward to working with you. So uh, Hugh, I know you're on the line, and, and uh, thank you very much for uh, for that uh, for that function. All right. Uh, thanks, Dave, and also uh, thanks to Ed for uh, doing a great job and getting all this stuff uh, established and, and running with it for a long time. Excellent. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. In terms of continuing education, Jose, you're on the line. Um, you've got a great webinar uh, uh, lined up for today, and, and you are going to continue in the continuing education vice chair. So any words from you? Are you on mute, Jose? Okay. I know that that Jose is is uh, is looking forward already in, in starting to plan the uh, next uh, webinar for our our uh, quarterly call in July. So um, uh, we appreciate all of the effort that he's made, and and we hope that you enjoy today's presentation. Um, Communications. Laura, are you on the line? I don't hear her. Uh, and and uh, Jim Oshwald is going to be uh, joining uh, uh, Laura to uh, help in the production of future issues of our uh, quarterly journal. Hopefully, you've all seen the quarterly journal today. Uh, it was supposed to have been uh, uh, distributed on Monday, but uh, we had a few minor glitches, technical glitches that we had to take care of. And so um, that was sorted out and and, uh, and the uh, journal is out to all members of the community of interest. If you haven't received it, please let me know. Um, the way to get it is that you need to go into your membership profile and make sure that you uh, check off uh, community of interest, the APC uh, community of interest. So please uh, do so if you haven't and, and uh, already. And, and again, I will be happy to send it to people who might not have received this issue. This is a pretty important one. That uh, leads us right into design awards program. Uh, JJ, I know that you're on. I don't know if Paula is on, but um, what would you like to tell us about the awards program? Sure, uh, Dave. Thank you. First of all, I you know hats off to uh, Dave, yourself, and the jury on this selection uh, award program. Has a lot of effort put in it, and uh, you can see the result as well. And all the industry responded. Um, it's just uh, amazing to see where we are, given the fact six months ago we were concerning you know whether people would be interested in this. What I would say in, in my reflection of eight years involved, nine years involved in SAME, uh, really, I, I wanted, like everybody knows, you know, we are the leaders of an industry. If you don't promote what we do, you don't, you will not expect others to promote what you do. So that's how we started at APC, the Architecture Practice Committee, because nobody was interested in what we do, not nobody, but you know, majority of people. And now we get a lot of attractions when the design award came up three years ago, um, because we realize in the industry, there is no such award to the military architecture, and it's important. Um, so you have to, as the you know, as leaders of of a, what we do in the industry, 
you have to promote. Otherwise, nobody will know. And after three years of planning, and there was a lot of ups and downs, and you know, at the last minute, and thanks to Paula, my co-chair, to push through the uh, SME headquarters and the work committees, now you see the result. So this is just the beginning of our journey of how we're going to even, um, like what Dave said, you know, in our missions to explore, uh, to broaden our opportunity exposure in the architectural community. And this is, would be a, one of the key venue for us to do that. Uh, you know, I really want to thank you for the, Dave yourself and put together the jury team. And thank you for everybody who submitted. And I think um, this is a biannual yeah, event, am I right? It's not, a, 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 it's not an annual event. I know in the award says annual, but I think it's uh, every other year. Am I right, Dave? That is correct. That's the, okay. Yeah, that, that was the, the way that it was presented for approval to the board uh, was as a biennial um, event. And, um, you know, I mean, I, I think that's the way that it will, will remain. Certainly, there's some opportunities there for um, enhancement or change uh, in, in the program. Uh, you know, we can look at other categories. We can, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take yeah. a learning uh, opportunity here uh, to, uh, to make changes that are, that are uh, directed by the participants. So any com comments or, or suggestions you have, uh, will be gratefully received and, and considered, and then we'll put that back before the board if we need. Yeah, exactly. And then anybody who's a, want to, you know, be part of the award program, please let us know as well. Myself and Paula Ann and Dave know, and then we need people to step up as well. So with that being said, uh, you know, uh, I'm going to turn back to you, Dave. I just want, once again, I just want to say thank you to everybody who involved in this program without your volunteer and your you know hard work we're not going to have to resolve what we have today and the last thing i would say uh we should uh, dave we should talk to the tme editor and headquarters aias and others to uh i don't know whether we have done that or have a shorter version to be to be uh featured or published at tmz um and and also you know at and then hit AIA with announcements as well. So we need to get our words out. This is uh, important to us. It's important to you know what the the architecture practice as well. You bet. So. Thanks, JJ. Well, and 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 that being said, um, offline we'll have that conversation with Ed and you and Paula. Uh, we do have a a separate pamphlet that uh, that can be that's available for anybody who's interested in it. Uh, we we took. Uh, the the uh, portion of the journal that included the a uh, there the uh, award announcements and uh, made that a separable and and separate um, uh, pamphlet to, to be distributed to the AIA and anybody else who's interested in PME. So we're going to be working that and coordinating that uh, in the near future. So probably I just received it today from uh, from Laura. So uh, again, that uh, that will be available to anybody who's interested in it. All right. That's it. Uh, go ahead, JJ. Sorry. Oh, that's it. Thank you. Back to you. All right. Very good. Um, I have a note here. Uh, the next item has to do with um, uh, uh, some discussion about from uh, Bell Fabraro, and this has to do with um, with uh, a, the need for moderators for Jetsy technical session. She's going to join us later on in the conversation today, uh, toward the end of our uh, session. But uh, we'll be looking for five moderators to help uh, uh, in the uh, presentation of technical sessions that are part of, of what um, National is going to be uh, presenting uh, as opportunities for people to, uh, to gain those uh, webinar continuing education credits. So um, if you're interested in being a moderator, uh, you know, please hold those thoughts until later on. And, and when Bell gets on, she'll answer any questions you have. Um, I, I have a note here about succession planning, but uh, you know, if, if there's any uh, area of, of the APC OI that you are, have interest in, um, communications, working with AIA, 
uh, sessions planning, any kind of uh, any kind of interest at all in participating in what it is we do to make this uh, community of interest a, a, an effective um, uh, group. Uh, please let me know. Uh, let Ed know. Let anybody uh, that's that's listed later on in these slides know uh, of your interest. Um, then uh, I, one of the things I, I don't want to let slip is that uh, we would have uh, well we would be celebrating the uh, Urban Metal uh, presentation to Captain Dan Cook um, in at Jetsy in in uh, the next uh, few weeks and um, and and I, I know that we'll be doing that again later but I, for those that aren't aware of it. Uh, Captain Cook uh, was the recipient of the Urban Medal this year. Um, we generally ask the Urban Medal recipient to provide a, a little bit of a uh, an article on on what inspired them to submit and and what allowed them to be uh, recognized for that for that award. So, uh, Dan, are you on the line by chance? I didn't see his name, so I. I but I, I want people to uh, uh, express their uh, congratulations to him if you have a chance to do so. Um, all righty, and then, uh, well, down at the bottom, I indicate those five moderators that are needed. We'll talk to uh, Bell about that uh, later on. So, all righty, next uh, next item, next uh, slide, please, Tamel. Um, we have three service branch liaisons, one for the Army, Navy, and Air Force. Uh, we are still working uh, to identify the, the representative from the Army. I don't know, Ed, if you've uh, had any, any uh, progress on that, and an Air Force liaison. And we're working through AFC to see what we can get, or AFCAC to see what we can get uh, as far as a representative there. Ed, do you have any word on the Army side? Uh, David, not yet. I know Kenny has been very tied up with COVID response, but uh, now that you've uh, gigged me a little bit, I'll send a note out to the group this afternoon and see if I can uh, see what I can rustle up. So thank you. Um, thank hey, you. Ed, this is uh, Hugh Darville. If, if Kenny or somebody else isn't interested, you could put my name in there too if you need to. Uh, all right, Hugh, I'll take that into account. But like I said, we like to try to expand the base of folks. So, but like I said, let me let me give the architecture uh, section a shot first, and if not, then I'll come back to you. All right, sounds good. Thanks, you. Thanks, Ed. And um, all righty, next slide, please. Um, Daphne Gorey uh, has has in the past been our architectural liaison co coordinator. What I'd like you all to consider, and this is a, an out of date list uh, that you can see, for example, Yvonne uh, Lee is, is still shown in the Pensacola uh, architectural liaison. Um, but, uh, and she's in Japan now. So um, one of the things I'd like to do is to reach out to the various posts and ask them to identify a person who is a POC for that post for the Architectural Practice Committee uh, Community of Interest. And uh, so please take a look at this. If you see your name, I saw Suzanne is on the line. Um, if, if you feel comfortable with that, that's great. Uh, you know, any other uh, posts that uh, we can identify uh, with somebody who would take the reins as the POC would be appreciated. The role here is to try to generate interest at the post level and uh, and and bring uh, additional resources to bear on our community of interest. So think about that carefully and and uh, and give us again some feedback. All righty, next slide, please. I apologize, I'm trying to go through this uh, quickly. All righty. Um, these are our points of contact. Again, as I mentioned before, some of the things that we uh, uh, that we address in the in the course of our day-to-day uh, -day operations um, go through these vice chairs. And uh, so, please reach out to them if you have interest in participating. 
at any level of our community of interest. Next slide, please. All righty. So um, the other thing I'll, I'll ask you to do, and I'm going to go up here and check my uh, questions. OK, excellent, excellent. Um, I see a couple of comments as moderators. I appreciate that. And that was another thing I was going to ask you. Uh, as we proceed through this uh, presentation today, both the webinar and anything that I've presented about the community of interest, uh, please go ahead and, and enter your comments or your questions in the, in the chat. And we'll address those at the end of the, end of the session. So, I think without uh, further hesitation, we'll, we'll go straight to the webinar. Um, uh, Tamel, would you like to make an introduction here? Hello, everyone. I'm Tamel Harbison. I am the Meetings and Programs Assistant with SAME's National Office. Uh, and welcome to today's webinar, High Performance Building Envelope, with our presenter. Just a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, we ask that you remain, uh, keep your phones remained on mute. Um, also, all questions that you have at any time during the presentation that you enter it into the chat functionality, and those questions will be at, uh, asked at the end of the presentation. Um, and also, this webinar is being recorded, just to let you know. Uh, I will introduce our presenter for today. Stephen Fret. Steve has Thank you, over Tamil. 20. Oh, oh. Go ahead. Sorry, Sorry. Tamil, you're, you're fading in and out, so that's why a uh, yeah. little little clumsiness there. But uh, not sure what the story is. A little technical issue. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Um, we're just going to get in uh, to the presentation. I'll uh, go ahead and start the introduction video. Hello, uh, again, my name is Steve Trout. I'm with Canon Building Envelope Specialists. Uh, the video that you're seeing up here on the screen is a building that was tested uh, back in 2005 uh, build, actually, and then we tested the building. As you notice here, we've let off these uh, glycol smoke type bombs within the structure. We used the mechanical system to pressurize the building and then went outside and took a video of the smoke. And as you can see at the parapet, it's just gushing out. Um, and just to let you know, we did uh, call a fire department ahead of time and they got so many calls that they had to show up. It looked like the building was on fire. You'll notice a roof exhaust. Designer does a great job bringing the roof up to the curb, but in comes a mechanical contractor, drops in his duct, leaves a two inch gap. So they're pretty leaky. Um, this presentation is actually on uh, buildings and, and how leaky buildings are, even still to this day, even though we have certain codes in place uh, to make sure that the building is tight. You'll notice uh, the overhang here as well. Uh, leaky. I apologize for the quality of the video has been probably, um, you know, copied a few times before it was uh, electronically sent. So um, around the windows, around the doors, whatever. So again, you know, Canon Building Envelope is a company that's been around for over 30 years now, air sealing all types of buildings across America, North America, into Europe. And actually, we just finished with uh, the ESCO train um the misawa air force base uh, over there that was i believe close to three million dollars worth of air sealing that was for energy uh energy you know savings um well, we have a little glitch with the video that's okay we can get right into the presentation this video is available if you'd like to you know see it tamel has it and he can send it to you um So this is a high performance um, building air leak kitchen effects on the building envelope, high performance buildings. Uh, just to let you know, we used to actually call this, uh, <laughs> this presentation, does your building suck? It is a play with words. Uh, they all suck and blow uh, through stack, wind and mechanical pressures. Um, 
Uh, it is an AIA certified um, you know, presentation. Um, we are actually owned by Tremco, just to let you know. Uh, we were purchased uh, about nine years ago. They saw the need uh, you know, to complete and to tie the roof to walls. And as, as many of us know, roofs and walls don't meet. Um, you know, you could have a fluted deck, uh, you know, a, a brick wall, and on the top you have what you call flashing around the uh, perimeter. And the definition of flashing is to hide the fact that the brick layer and the roof are never met. That's the biggest disconnect in a building. And we find um, any air sale contractor across North America actually will tell you the, um, the roof to wall intersection is the most important aspect of the building. That's where stack pressures are the greatest. But we're gonna run through step by step uh, in the building. So understand the definition of high performance building and the importance of air and moisture management to occupants. Uh, understand the connection building envelope and the impact for the facilities, durability, sustainability, energy efficiency, occupant comfort, health and indoor air quality. And, and of course, this is big on the list now. And we'll get into a little bit about COVID-19 uh, and then also as we go through the presentation. Understand the application differences of air barrier products and types, new construction. Now, this presentation is more for retrofit existing buildings. Um, I guess our stick is, you know, build it, uh, you know, let them screw it up and we'll come in afterwards and, and seal it up sort of thing. But um, I, I just want to point out that uh, air barrier is a system. Uh, you could have the best air barrier product on the market. And if it's not tied to another air barrier product, then you really don't have a good air barrier or as a system approach. And understand what causes the building uh, air leakage in existing asset and how to take care of it, basically. So the term high performance building means a building that integrates and optimizes all major high performance building attributes. So it's including energy efficiency, durability, life cycle performance and occupant productivity. And the four elements of high performance building, which we're going to run through is heat flow, airflow and pressure, moisture and air barrier. Air quality, I'm sorry. Um, this here, uh, and I mentioned about tying, uh, you know, air barrier products together. So continuity is the most characteristic of the air barrier uh, for infiltrating, exfiltrating air. Now, there's three different types of flows, diffusion, orifice, and channel. Now, the uh, picture on the right, the channel flow, uh, air can travel, for instance, if it's a, a you know, hose bib, bib on the outside, air travels up through the cavity wall insulation and in. Um, or you have orifice flow, which is a direct flow of air through, say, maybe around a window system, even around, uh, you know, an operable window where the weather stripping has degraded over time sort of thing. And then one of the most important uh, part and what has changed the whole industry um, many years back in Canada, I'm from Toronto, so um, back in the late uh, 70s, they did a test, and I'm going to show you the results very shortly. But diffusion flow, all products uh, will diffuse some type of moisture or amount of moisture through it. So um, the air barrier allows proper control of air movement in and out of the building um, enclosure, and we're encompassing all six sides of the building. And also we talk about decoupling. Um, as buildings get taller, um, you know, stack pressures get greater, so we start to decouple floor to floor. So this is a slide that changed here. I think it's all, in, I put it in American measurements here. Um, as you notice, there's, these are actually two pieces of drywall. The one on the left, uh, as you can see, doesn't have a hole in it. The, right, the one on the right has a quarter inch hole. Uh, see if the measurement will come up here. Oh, yeah, a quarter inch hole or three quarter inch hole, I should say. Um, each of these pieces were painted uh, with two, uh, two coats of oil-based paint, basically to simulate a vapor barrier. They were both stuck into two separate chambers to simulate an Ottawa winter, which is approximately about seven months long. You'll note the peaks on the left only collected 10 ounces of moisture or one uh, third liter of moisture through diffusion. And the piece on the right collected eight gallons of moisture. So this is where we set up it as an industry and said, hey, it's not the vapor barrier to stop moisture migration, but it's the air barrier, fill the gaps, cracks, and holes. So 100 times more moisture. So three items in condition building influences air, which I call it HAM, heat, air, and moisture. Uh, heat equates to energy efficiency and equipment sustainability. 
air comfort, productivity, and indoor air quality, and then moisture building uh, durability. So building air and leakage consequences, um, you know, there's many components here as we're showing. Uh, occupant comfort, and to this day, we still find that we are on job sites more so uh, into buildings because of occupant comfort. Too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry. Or bugs, irritants are, you know, driving people crazy uh, within the structure. For instance, we've been, uh, you know, up to about a month and a half ago, heavily into the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth area in hospitals where yellow ladybugs were getting into the OR rooms, um, you know, traveling through gaps, cracks, and holes into the structure, roof wall intersection, round window systems, even getting in through weep holes, and then, uh, you know, a bridge in the, uh, the air barrier, uh, they were getting into the OR rooms. So, indoor air quality, um, a lot of air seal contractors work with uh, indoor air quality companies. Uh, there's one in particular that we work with where they're actually calling us in after they do spray and sometimes even before, um, to, uh, you know, against the virus, where they call us in to tighten up the envelope. Very, very hard to control uh, air movement within a structure when there's so many uh, air leakage points in it. And we'll get into that a little bit further into the presentation, indoor air quality, uh, durability of the building. Um, you know, further in the uh, north part of North America, we find in the wintertime, we get a lot of calls where uh, buildings have a lot of efference, efferescence at the top. Um, this could be caused by stack pressure, you know, as, you know, it pulls in cold air, warm air rises, pulling the moisture up. The moisture, you know, heads up to the top of the building. Moisture gets into the salts and the mortar, and then the salts actually uh, appear on the front facade sort of thing. Uh, wind effect, it's top right one there. Um, many, many jobs done because of wind pressure. Um, you know, in fact, one of them, downtown Toronto, where a uh, client was complaining, uh, it's a high rise part of a, um, you know, a, a shopping center uh, with an office tower, two office towers attached to it. Curtain wall system where the curtain wall after 25 years, the sealant in the curtain wall had failed and uh, which opened up a pathway for air leakage. And we'll get into that stack effect uh, shortly as well. And then HVAC sizing. We always find that uh, mechanical contractors oversize equipment uh, for allowing for air leakage. Uh, but if you start off with a tight building, you can reduce the uh, mechanical sizing by up to 20%. Case in point, project in um, Charleston, South Carolina, school board, uh, one of their schools are uh, actually laid out close to $5 million on new equipment. And for $86,000 of air sealing, they could have saved close to a million dollars by tightening up the building envelope. And then not necessarily last on the list, but energy efficiency. And we find energy efficiency is a justification at this time, unless and the work that is being performed is being performed for an ESCO. They're looking for the quick payback sort of thing. Uh, energy still isn't costly enough to motivate people to do something to their buildings, we're finding. But if they have a bug in infestation or uh, odor complaints or something like that, or comfort complaints, uh, the energy efficiency factor is a justification. So, so there's been influences, and in some of these influences have been around for years, as we know. Uh, you know, ASHRAE, uh, new codes for air tightness. Uh, you know, International Building Code. There's a whole list here. ABBA. Um, hopefully, most of you are familiar with ABBA. Not the singing group, but Air Barrier Association of America. Uh, you know, we were actually part of the um, uh, U.S. Army. Uh, protocol for air tightness in buildings. Uh, we did uh, five sessions across uh, no, uh, up across the US uh, doing seminars similar to this here, um, educating on uh, you know, cost-effective air sealing. And also um, Dr. Alexander Zivoff had us part of the deep energy retrofit design a guide that was produced in 2017. So, um, so uh, the influences have been out there. We're getting, we are getting better. Um, so 
looking through a building, uh, you need basic diagnostic tools. And just to let you know, uh, air seal contractors will use the inner core as the air barrier. So you have, say, that drywall wall uh, tied to the window, you know, making sure that the window is tied to the wall. Uh, if it's an oper operable window system, of course, you know, is the weather stripping, uh, you know, tight, that sort of thing. So creating continuity from the inside. Uh, in the existing buildings, we may not necessarily know what's behind that wall and it isn't cost effective um, by knocking holes into walls to get at holes. Uh, cost goes up, payback, payback goes up as well. Um, all of a sudden then you're talking 50, 100 year payback sort of thing. We find in North America on average it's between three to 10 year payback on doing cost effective uh, air sealing. So basic diagnostic tools, you need someone trained um, you know, building science person to walk through with the camera intake form. Uh, there's also now a few uh, new um, apps out there for gathering this data. Uh, smoke pencil, as you saw uh, in the video, um, you know, using the mechanical system to, uh, system to pressurize and then letting off smoke bombs. A lot of clients will not allow us to do that. So we walk around with this little smoke pencil. You see that second picture over. Um, it's an air leakage detector. Unfortunately, uh, the manufacturers now stopped um, manufacturing because of sh shipping purposes, um, the cost and, and whatnot to ship them, but it was one of the best devices ever. There's some new electronic ones out uh, that aren't too bad, but I personally like this one here. We actually nicknamed that one Billy Graham. And the reason why we nicknamed it Billy Graham was because it turned the client religious when they saw the smoke going in and out and they became believers right away sort of thing. So, um, and then infrared camera, um, most air seal contractors won't necessarily do a full building scan, like facade scan. The camera is actually used at the measure that they're looking at, for instance, roof wall intersection from the inside, you know, shining the camera up there to determine thermal differences, <coughs> excuse me. And then another device that's used is a Velocicalc and it will take temperature, RH, CO2, and pressure differences. And, and we use it a lot for pressure differences when we get into zoning. Uh, for instance, if you're you know, in a hospital infectious control area, um, we can determine if there's a air leakage point between the two sort of things. So. <laughs> now there's also uh, big fans or blower doors. The one in the center is probably the one that would be used to uh, you know, test your home. It's a 5,000 CFM fan, stick it in the front door, uh, run you know, six to eight different uh, points on it to determine how leaky the building is or the house is. Um, the blue units there are manufactured by a company in the US called Infotech. They have 50, 60 and 70,000 feet CFM fans, stick them in the back of a, uh, you know, a back of the building a shipping door and, and do the same thing as you would with a smaller fan system. The one up to the top, I actually personally prefer that one there. Those ones there, each of those fans are about 8,000 CFF fans. So you bring the number of fans for the size of building that you're testing on that day sort of thing. <clears throat> really in a way, um, most air seal contractors that have done uh, testing at the beginning um, of time may not necessarily need fans. Uh, there is pressure difference always stack wind and mechanical and um, being an ex experienced uh, you know, air seal contractor um, would know exactly where air leakage points are. And there's about 12 different uh, air points in a building that we do look at in our measures details. So failure of the air barrier makes the building less healthy. It's unsafe, less durable, uncomfortable, and it certainly is an energy efficient building. And I don't know if you can see there, but there's a, a crack underneath the door, very typical. Um, so leads to uncontrollable, uncontrollable air leakage, infiltrating and exfiltrating air. Uh, the picture on the right is a platinum lead building in Boston. You can see the smoke pouring out around the door. <coughs> It's actually one of the leakiest buildings that I've ever tested. It's a platinum lead building. Um, the owner of the building actually walked around with us that day and he said when they get a wind off the, um, off the bay, the window systems start to whistle. 
So pretty leaky building. So it's caused by stack, wind, and mechanical, as I mentioned earlier. <coughs> um, North Americans are actually spending, you know, 80 to 90 percent of their time in in their homes or in their their offices. And in fact, now that's increased due to uh, the you know the virus at this time. Um, you know, we also have sick building syndrome. Um, question for you there, and I know you can't all answer it, but what is an unhealthy building, a tight building or a loose building? It is a bit of a trick question. Um, you know, a loose building allows a lot of pollutants in and, you know, um, dirt and, and whatnot. And a tight building uh, can hold in a lot of moisture and pollutants at the same time. So basically, our model is seal tight, vent right provide mechanical ventilation, proper mechanical ventilation for that type of building and use of the building. So thermal comfort involves humidity, airspeed, temperature, clothing, and activity. And again, as I mentioned, too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, thermal comfort. Um, it is a byproduct, uh, financial benefit, um, energy efficiency that will save money. Um, more efficient ventilation in the HVAC system. So again, um, oversizing will um, will cause issues, um, and undersizing actually will cause issues. So um, more efficient use of pumps and fans. Uh, the system actually will last a lot longer as well. If the building's so leaky, the system keeps you know running and running. Um, so that 20 or 25 years that you usually get out of the system. Uh, will be shortened for sure. Uh, recommendations in this order is to actually air seal the building first, uh, filling the gaps, cracks, and holes. Insulate if uh, insulation can uh, be added at that time. It's a good time to add, you know, up your hours on that. Um, and HVAC upgrade. So at that point, um, a calculation can be done um, after the building is tightened to determine what, what size equipment. <laughs> so uh, the first effect, as we mentioned earlier, is stack effect. And this is a little bit of uh, building science 101. Um, cold air gets in through the bottom. It gets point, travels up through the top. Um, in the around the center, you get what you call neutral pressure plane. And this is where your infiltrating air uh, changes to infra uh, exfiltrating air. The more holes you have up at the top, uh, the greater the stack pr pressures. Um, the greater the outside temperature to the inside temperature, the greater the stack pressures. Um, also, in the summertime when we're cooling our buildings, we get reverse stack pressures. Or if we're in the south, and I'm going to show you a case study, a southern one that was a pretty bad one <coughs> for air leakage. Um, but, you know, cold air, uh, air conditioned air is, is heavier. It actually, if your roof wall is open, it actually will pull in the warm, moist air and it'll drop down and create, you know, mold issues. So. And, and I also want to make a point here too is about decoupling. As buildings get taller, stack pressures get greater. So any building that's three stories and above, and it depends on where it is in that, maybe sometimes four stories and above, we like to decouple each floor as if it's independent from one another. If you can achieve that, then you can reduce stack pressures even greater and save more money. And it's a health and safety issue too. For instance, if you have a fire on say the fifth floor, smoke can travel from floor to floor, uh, which we did have a fire in a building uh, we were involved with after the fact, we went in and decoupled each floor to reduce the stack pressures. Uh, in this case here, people tried to get out on the 30th floor, the roof door was locked and they died of smoke inhalation. And they calculated that the smoke traveled uh, up that corridor or the stairwell uh, within minutes. Um, then we had wind effect. I mentioned earlier about that, uh, you know, the two towers at the, um, at the shopping mall there where wind pressure on one side. So cold air was hitting that side of the building. It swirls around the building, uh, causing eddy currents, and then it sucks your conditioned air out on the opposite side of the building. And wind pressures do change, so. And then mechanical effect, which we have two effects. We have negative. Um, this is where you're exhausting so much. As you notice, the neutral pressure plane is up at the top of the building, and then you're pulling in all that out uncon unconditioned 
you know, uh, polluted, polluted air, dirt, whatever, into the structure. And then we have positive pressure. Now we want slight positive pressure in our buildings, but um, what we find is a lot of times mechanical contractors will try and overcome stack pressures mechanically by overpressurizing. Like how many of you have walked up to a front door and the front doors are you know flying open sort of thing. So in this case here, so much positive pressure, you've moved your neutral pressure plane down to the bottom of the building. And then all of that air that you're heating or cooling is expelling uh, out through the gaps and cracks and holes, which is not cost effective whatsoever. So how do you implement? There is a process for the assessment. Uh, so building envelope assessment, walking through the building. Uh, in most cases, a air seal contractor can walk you through a building in like a day, you know, up to about 200 to 250,000 square feet and a day of assessing, looking at each of the measures, looking at all the doors, looking at all the windows, that sort of thing. Um, if need be, doing a deep restoration test, like a fan test, and then locating air leakage paths with, uh, with the smoke, as you can see here. And the picture on the right is a theatrical smoke generator, which can be used. Uh, for instance, um, I remember doing a mechanical room where we pressurized it, let off the smoke, and went outside and took video. So uh, by walking through the building, uh, building envelope assessment, oh, this is, sorry, this is a repeat. Infrared thermography, um, again, the camera is mostly used just at the measure that we're looking at, but here just showing a few photos of thermal difference in different types of buildings here. Now the components are the top, bottom, vertical shafts, outside walls, and not necessarily last on the list of all of this is compartmentalization, the compartmentalization of any room that's part-time or full-time vented to the exterior. So the top of the building where stack pressures are the greatest, see all buildings, we classes being chimneys uh, because they are so leaky. So if attics, for instance, even in your own home, roof wall intersection, again, if that's uh, you know that's open, that's causing a lot of issues. Mechanical penthouse doors, HVAC equipment. <clears throat> Here's a picture of a roof wall intersection. The picture on the right, you can see here, um, tested with a smoke pencil or Billy Graham, we call it again. Um, the smoke is just pouring out, as you can see. But really, we didn't have to test that. And the reason why we didn't have to test it, you can see the leaf there. A leaf had blown in <clears throat> um, and into the roof wall. Um, we, uh, we did actually six schools um, just outside of Toronto where s s snow was coming in, blowing in underneath the flashing, dropping on the drop ceiling. They thought they had a roof leak. Uh, Ten different roofers came in, you know, cut cores just to test. The, the roof was perfectly fine. Uh, what, what was happening was the snow was coming in and melting. So quick air seal. Um, one of the schools, there are six schools, one of the schools, there was a savings of 35.5% on their, their uh, first winter heating bill. Um, I think the lowest was about 5.5%. So. so air can travel up through the cavity wall, insulation and into the plenum space is shown here. Through the equalized pressure plane or the drip plane and in to the um, uh, plenum space or through the roof deck, as you can see in this arrow here. The roof deck isn't the best air barrier. It's riddled with holes and seams. This is showing as a fluted deck. Uh, what is done to achieve or to try and uh, create air barrier continuity, and I'm hoping it's in this next photo. There it is. Uh, the picture on the right, the installer here has punched a hole into the flute. He's using a two-component polyurethane closed cell foam. Uh, similar to the stuff that you see at your local home, uh, Lowe's, Home Depot, Rona, whatever. Um, it's a slow rise froth system. So when he pumps this, where he's pumping it into the hole, it's a quarter inch hole. He can drill it or punch it. Um, the foam is actually going to travel within that flute. We want the foam to travel to the outside flashing or to the back of the flashing. The main thing is by doing what we're doing there is we're trying to get to the membrane above, and then we're gonna spray the block to the roof deck to create air barrier continuity. Uh, this is, I'm gonna talk about the products at, towards the end. 
but it is a slow rise product that travels and sets within uh, 45 to 60 seconds. Picture on the left, you can see that's a uh, roof wall again, and the smoke is just pouring out because of stack pressures or because of the pressurization in the building. I mentioned, uh, you know, at the beginning during the movie, uh, you know, where designers does a, do a great job bringing the roof up to the curb, but in comes a mechanical guy, drops in his duct, leaves a two inch gap. That is actually a two inch gap is a picture on the right. We're filling it up with a one component uh, closed cell foam. Um, a lot of the times that's flashed over on the curb, but it's still not sealed. So you get enough of these at the top of the, uh, you know, the building. Um, it's a big, big hole and a lot of issues because of stack pressures. Uh, picture on the left is actually just showing a roof there. And when we had calculated the whole size at the top of the building with the roof exhaust and the roof wall, it was like having three open doors on top of the building. That's a pretty big hole. Um, the picture on the on the bottom left is actually a roof exhaust that was flipped back and we're looking right at the drop ceiling. So that's a big, big hole. That's an eight square foot hole right there alone. And then of course, roof, uh, roof mechanical units, large units like this, certainly wouldn't get a crane and lift them up, but uh, air seal contractor would get to them from down below. Roof level change, uh, another air leakage point. The roof door, roof doors are normally the worst door on the building um, in some cases. I've even seen carpet stapled to the door itself. So, and then uh, the top, uh, the bottom of the building, a unique part of the building. Uh, it's a ground floor, and anything below. One of the things I like to point out in here is soffits, soffit or overhangs. A lot of the times, soffits are open, and soffits literally suck air through. So, say for instance, you're at a front entrance way where you have a drop ceiling. You move the drop ceiling, and you're looking right into the overhang. That should be compartmentalized or decoupled from the rest of the building. Um, that's a high air leakage point. And then we have a whole list of other items here, um, which we'll show you a few pictures. Um, picture on the right is a typical door. You, didn't, you don't even have to open it, you can slither through. Look at how large that gap is. Um, picture on the left is actually a um, entrance into an underground parking. I don't know uh, where you're located, if there's a lot of underground parking, but uh, you can see the dirt around the pipe, conduit penetrations up there. Um, a lot of the times we like to test that door um, connection to the inside of the building by having the fans for the exhaust on, and we'll stand in the garage part and use our smoke puffer to see which way the smoke goes. We actually want the smoke to come back out at us, but over 95% of the time, it goes into the building. And we wonder why, and people wonder why that there's dirt lines up, you know, five, six stories uh, up in a building that's 20, 30, 40, you know, stories high sort of thing. It's pulling the dirt from the underground parking all the way through the building, through stack pressures. Typical doors, this is at, at Mayo Clinic in um, Rochester. Minnesota, uh, you can see the, grap uh, the gaps between the doors, double door system, and I'll show you a few um, uh, door sets that could, uh, you know, rectify that issue. Uh, here's a soffit. This is actually a hospital as well. Don't know if you can see the picture on the left. Um, the ceiling tiles have bowed. Uh, we, that's one of the first thing that you should look at if you have a drop ceiling is to, to check to see if the ceiling tiles are blow, blowing like that. Uh, it could be because of a roof leak or you know any moisture uh, getting in and uh, doing that to the tile. So when that ceiling tile was popped up, we're looking right into the soffit and that's the picture to the right. So we've done top, bottom, now vertical shafts. Um, again, remember I mentioned about decoupling each floor. Uh, to reduce stack pressure. So these are items that connect floor to floor. Stairwell fire doors, fire hose cabinets if they're plumb, plumbing electrical. Uh, elevator rooms. Um, elevators are a very uh, sticky subject. Um, we would like to actually weather strip the uh, each door on each floor, uh, but we can't do that. It's against the law to do that. Um, so 
what we like to do is the penthouse elevator penthouse we uh, seal the top up um, so it you know like capping the top of the building to reduce static pressures a garbage chute highway pressurization elevators whole list of items here um, the picture on the right is a fire hose cabinet see we find like uh, electricians like to wear site or wear size 16 still toe boots to kick holes and pull wires and plumbers well at least plumbers cover the holes with escutcheons but those are never sealed so in this uh, fire hose cabinet you have a lot of holes in there um, it, and it's all surface sealing with a low odor caulking material um, you know seal around the escutcheons uh, any crack in there you know screw holes whatever that cabinet there is in a chase way so what's happening is with all of these holes in it it's pulling your conditioned air from each floor and up and again this is a fire safety smoke uh, safety issue and then the picture on the left of course is a, a stairwell door uh, they're never weather stripped very easily to do uh, gas pipe going floor to floor. The picture on the right is actually an electrical closet. You can see they shove filter bats. I call fiberglass filter bats. It may be good thermally if installed properly, uh, but it is a filter. It's not a good air barrier. Air can travel through, and as you can see, it's so dirty, so at least the air as it's traveling through is cleaner as it goes floor to floor, I guess. And then um, again, this is a in a commercial building. You have men's washroom one side, ladies on the other. That's a plumbing stack behind there, and you can see all of the escutcheons. And the, in fact, some of the uh, pipes don't even have you know escutcheons over it, so it's a direct hole. Again, it's pulling the conditioned air from floor to floor. Not healthy or safe. Uh, if you've been to Boston, this is one of the tallest buildings in Boston. It's 53 stories high. This is from the roof. Uh, Airso contractors will actually walk the roof first and walk floor to floor, gathering all of their data. So in this case here, this is an open pit. It goes all the way into the basement. Uh, it's about 20 feet by 15 feet wide. On the bottom left of the picture, I don't know if you can see it that well, but there's a caged in cement platform. And I guess that's to get at the services that run through it. There's a man door in there. Um, the, those doors weren't weather stripped. So what was happening was pulling the conditioned air all the way up. Uh, their heating bill every winter was well over a million dollars. So, and a lot of comfort issues. It is designed as a, that's an old um, smoke shaft. So it's basically a fire happens, the door opens, smoke travels up. So we told them just get an engineer uh, to design a capped unit at the top that opens up on demand they would save in seconds because of this, you know, this hole on top of the building. And then outside walls, we find that's more thermal comfort, but there's also an energy aspect to it. So weather strip windows, doors, uh, and just to point out windows, um, a air seal contractor can uh, re-retrofit or retrofit a window for one-tenth, one-fifth, the cost of replacing a window system. Um, so as opposed to a, a 30 to 50 year payback on a new window system, it's a three to five year payback. And then exhaust fans and ducting, anything that penetrates the outside wall through there. So, um, so here, you know, fixed window systems, and a lot of you have probably seen this. Uh, you can see that the seals have shrunk. Um, you take a smoke pencil up to that, puff it, and the smoke goes right out. It travels through the track and out. Uh, the seals actually have popped out there. There's different ways of rectifying that, but again, um, cost-effective methods to get it within that three to five year payback. Uh, operable window, the one on the right, that's a hopper style window. It's latched and locked, and you can see the smoke just pouring right out of it. And then on the left, um, it's not just the window system itself but the trim uh, around the windows to the wall and you can see the smoke pouring out so air barrier continuity um, and cost effective air barrier continuity if you have electric baseboard heaters i mentioned earlier about electricians wearing size 16 steel toe boots to kick holes to pull their wires through this guy looked like he tripped you can see the long line of hole of in there um, where the lead wire comes through the wall is where the hole is, and that's where the thermostatic control is. So 
Uh, and a lot of these units here, we find they don't shut up all winter long because of the cold air blowing on the back of it. So to create con continuity is to, you know, the, the baseboard uh, heater, the baseboard receptacle outlet, uh, weather strip the windows and caulk the window trim to create air barrier continuity, cost-effective air barrier continuity. And not necessarily last on the list, but compartmentalization. So that's any room that's part-time or full-time vented to the ex exterior, whole list here. Uh, shipping door. Um, here, uh, a, a workshop on the right there, you can see the dirt around the conduit. Uh, there's dirt around the block. Um, this room here was a workshop where, you know, they throw on a fan when they took some solvent out or whatever, and it was sucking the air through. So in that case there, compartmentalize that from the rest of the building, like a, um, you know, a boiler room where there's a four by four grill on the side of the wall, the grill opens uh, when the appliance fall calls for air, but yet with a lot of the times we see the doorway leading into the condition spaces and weather strip, there's duct and pipe penetrations. So compartmentalize, treat it outside the envelope. So do a, a conduct a building envelope assessment, you know, walking through the building, determine location and severity, identify internal pathways, and by doing this, you end up with a uh, scope of work. Each measure that's looked at, um, there's a crack dimension uh, associated to it, which is out of the ASHRAE Fundamental Handbook. It's modified slightly. Uh, for instance, doors, uh, you won't run around with a tape measure measuring the bottom or in between the doors. Um, you just associate a 16th inch crack around those doors. Take the linear footage of the doors, divided by 12, divided by 16, and you get the total size of hole. Um, obtain the energy bill. Um, we can determine from there the CFM of air that's leaking in and out of that size hole and then work back what type of savings that could be had by doing that. So different materials, as I mentioned, this is the two component polyurethane froth system. Uh, the kit on the left is a 600 board foot kit. Uh, you have an ISO and a polyol. It travels through the, the, uh, the gun hose assembly. Uh, into the gun, through the nozzle, it mixes together, creating the polyurethane foam. It shouldn't be confused with the product that you see on HD TV shows where they spray. Uh, it's a, that's a violent reaction of chemicals. It washes out within 20 seconds and sets. Uh, this here is a slow rise product, as I mentioned earlier, 45 to 60 se uh, seconds to travel. So you're able to fill blind wall cavity fill at that point. Comes in two different sizes. If any of you decide to purchase this, please read the instructions. No one ever reads the instructions. And you'll always make sure that you wear the proper PPE. Just a word of caution out there. Um, then also, we're not showing a picture here, but one component polyurethane foam for gaps under two inches and between a quarter inch and two inch. Uh, if anything, use a closed cell, like a higher closed cell content. Uh, there's six manufacturers in, in the US. Um, I'm just going to reference one of them. Uh, great stuff, uh, they, uh, which is a Dow chemical product. They have a product called Great Stuff Pro. It has a 72% plus um, closed cell content. Again, uh, read the instructions on, on that. I personally believe that the manufacturer should sell them in sets of two. After you've you know, used the first tin and you know screwed it up read the instructions and use the second one sort of thing um, so it, that one component works under moisture cure the kits that you see here is chemically cured okay and then uh, caulking products again the key thing if you're going to do anything in your home as well um, use products that are low odor um, a lot of the times there's a uh, DAP has some, Tremco has some, um, pretty well all the manufacturers of the, of the caulking uh, have a low odor. Uh, a lot of them, they go on white, they dry clear, they're paintable, washable, key thing, low odor. And then weather strips, the one on the left is a uh, door weather strip. Um, there's about five different manufacturers in North America that uh, has this uh, detail of weather strip. That will take up to a, a warp, so a, a three-eighths warp in a door. 
Um, the holder, it, it, most of them guarantee it for 20 years. It's the insert um, that they can't guarantee because the door, you know, depending on usage and where the door is sort of thing, uh, that may wear within a year and it may last for 20 years sort of thing. So nice thing is that insert can snap out and you can snap a new one in. There's a whole line of weather strips um, as well. And if you want to talk more weather strips at some time, you can get a hold of me or I can give you a list of manufacturers. And then when you get into rated rooms, you need rated products. The foam here is on the lift on the left is just showing we're showing the foam maybe we spray that in as a backer and then a cementitious mortar over it it um the products used are products um that are required under code for whatever that room or wall assembly is so financial everybody asks about financial right now um because energy had dropped last few years now it's starting to climb now a little bit uh, we find that the it's close to seven cents per square foot uh, annual savings. Um, a cost, you know, people say, well, how much is it, you know, to do our building sort of thing to um, to actually do the building envelope work? And it ranges between thirty to fifty cents um, per, per square per square feet. Now, one of the case studies I'm going to show you is a, a lot more, only because it was extremely leaky. Um, we're looking at, on average, in North America, three to 10 year peri uh, payback period. So if you have a building 100,000 square feet, you're saving 6,700 uh, at you know, 30 to $50,000 to do the work sort of thing. The, say, uh, the um, payback, it is what it is sort of thing. Um, nobody ever wants to overpromise and underdeliver. Under so in fact, we find um, you know, if you state a three-year payback, you're going to get better than that in some cases. So now that the building is tight, now what? So evaluate, rebalancing isn't necessarily. Again, it's very hard to balance um, the mechanicals in the building if you have so many gaps, cracks, and holes in it. Um, you know, the day that your mechanical contractor comes in to balance it, it could be the stillest day on, on earth. Um, next day, temperatures drop when pressure picks up, the whole balancing is thrown off. So after the building is air sealed, tightened up, that's the time to do it. Check, you know, as a contractor, you'd be checking to make sure areas that were cold or too hot, you know, have, have been taken care of. RH level as well. Um, one also thing I like to point out, it's more on the mechanical aspect, but check coils to see if they're packed with dust and dirt. A lot of them are, that's 10 to 12% energy hog right there. So I'll evaluate any other issues, you know, pest, uh, moisture issues and, and whatnot. So air barrier continuity, improving health, safety, durability, comfort and energy efficiency in all types of buildings. As easy as ABC, that's a, a little play with words, air barrier continuity. Um, all types of buildings and we find um, clients purchase in that order order health safety durability comfort and energy efficiency just a few like a quick uh, case study here and, and then we can open it up for questions so this was a hospital in Homer Louisiana reason why um, air seal contractor was in here was because of mold um, the gentleman that was mitigating mold from one end of the hospital to the other, um, no sooner had he finished the hospital, the mold was reoccurring. So please note, um, you'll see the main entrance sign here and in that soffit overhang around the whole perimeter of the, uh, the hospital. 45,000 square foot hospital, rural type hospital. Um, I would mentioned that buildings get leakier and leakier as you go south, or at least I thought I'd mentioned that, but they do for some reason in warmer temperatures. Well, the reason being is in North climate, people don't want to feel cold in their home in their homes or buildings. So the we have a tendency in the north to build tighter. In the south, I guess uh, you know if they start to feel a little bit warm, they turn the air conditioner down more. So also leaks or, or gaps above the doors here, as you can see. Roof exhaust flip back. Half of the roof exhaust in this hospital, you were looking at drop ceiling. Okay. So large holes at the top. 
Here's the soffit, as you notice on the outside. This is on the outside where we popped our head through the inspection hatch. This is the outside of the inside wall. Note at the uh, roof wall, there's no air barrier there whatsoever. And then this is the inside of the outside wall. Again, there's nothing there. So what was happening was it was um, at the roof wall here, it was pulling in the warm, moist air, condensating, running down the cavity wall, hitting the slab, and then through capillary capillaries. The capillary capillary action was, you know, you're getting rising damp, drywall was moist, mold was causing, you know, happening, and the contractor was cutting mold, you know, foot to three feet up from the walls continually. Um, the front soffit, um, a thermal um, insulation board was put up to close it all off and then the foam was to seal it. Note the size of the bead and the foam here. Um, this foam can be left exposed um, after we've actually uh, spoke with the code officials. If you do a small bead, it's well within the smoke development and the, uh, the fire rating. Um, Again, once you talk about foam, people think you're blanketing the whole thing, and then that changes, you know, your fire ratings whatsoever. So, or it does change. So, a prediction of 5.2 year payback was predicted, but they got better than three. The cost of this job, even though it was 45,000 square feet, it was well over that 30 to 50 cents per square foot for doing building envelope work. It was 52,000. They have now added on to this hospital. Uh, they were going to tear it down actually um, when they had so much mold in it. So we saved the hospital. Um, other ones, Edward Hospital in Naperville. Um, the facility I was trying to control stack pressures and zone pressures within the main part of the hospital couldn't do it. So leaky. Um, it was tightened up. Now they can control everything. So, and then the one, one on the right was uh, Arkansas State University. That one there was thermal comfort. It was over the 10 year, it was actually a 12.1 year payback, but it was comfort that dr drove that, uh, that project. So thank you. Hopefully you've enjoyed all the BS and building science that I've uh, expressed to you. Uh, our, I guess we'll open up for questions. This is, this is Dave, and uh, I want to thank you, uh, Steve, for your great presentation. Um, I, 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 and we'll open it up for questions now. We're a little bit, uh, yeah, you know, not, we're right about on time. It's 12:15, but we would take a few more, a que few questions from folks if, uh, if you have any. All right. If, if not, I, I, I do have a question. You know, Steve, yeah. the, the uh, challenge that I see as a uh, as a designer is that you know we have a pretty good good understanding of what uh, building envelopes yeah. <laughs> and ceilings uh, the sealants are all about, but you know there's that handoff between the designer and the construction contractor, and and you know I don't know that I've covered everything when I design a building, um, mm -hmm. and then I don't know that the contractor is going to you know. Yeah do what I ask him to do. Um, so, exactly. and is there a key to that? I mean, who's the, who's the guy that, that, in, that takes care of that? Is it an architectural engineer? Well, how do we give well, ourselves the best chance? Okay, so, okay. So it is our architectural engineer, but, and, and you're right, David, that's the biggest disconnect that we find, you know, pardon the pun on that, all that, but, um, is you know you could design the best building with the best air barrier and then when it's implemented then things you know go go as and we see it all the time sort of thing um i mentioned about aba air barrier association of america so there are you know designs i mean aba is the one that actually got the building code into the u.s uh you know building code basically the air barrier into the building uh into the building code and they actually have uh if you design a building through ABBA specs, they actually will send somebody out uh, through stages of the building and make sure that the air barrier is intact and done properly. I mean, that's so, one way around it, but, um, you know, I think, uh, 
I think really you should go on ABBA's website and see what they have to offer. I mean, we're at their main conference every year. It's a great co conference. Um, you know, a bunch of designers are there to learn and, and uh, you know, it, it's just a great, great conference. We're, we're just seeing buildings are getting better because of, uh, because of ABBA as well. So. Hey, Steve, this is John, John Mogi is, is there a, a good reference to the UFC for air barrier control to use in these military projects? Well, there is there is a there is a, a standard, yes, yeah. The uh, U.S. Army Corps actually has a standard for air tightness in protocol book too. You can actually I you can actually download. I could send you a link to it as well. Okay, thank hey. you. Hi, this is Nadia Turek. Um, I was going to ask, I put a question in the comments. Um, the latest version of the lead rating system has uh, some incentive, two points, to do building envelope commissioning. Um, yep. So to Dave's question about how we can make sure that there's follow through on the design intent of our air barriers, do you have um, experience with either lead or non-lead uh, building envelope commissioning that you could share with us? and? Uh, uh, yeah, um, I personally haven't, but I do have a few people on staff that have. But um, I certainly can have them get a hold of you and, and discuss that, sure. Okay, I just wanted to point it out to the group. I, I know you had a, a bit of a knock there on the LEED Platinum building that was very leaky. Yep. Uh, that's been, you know, LEED is a ever-evolving tool in the toolkit, and that's something they certainly added because it's so yeah. important. Thanks. Well, they have recently, yes, but for a good number of years, they didn't have air barrier in there. Yeah. So this is Charles Enos. Can you hear me? Yeah. Gotcha. Okay, good. So I think one of the comments uh, back to the same original question with David had, I think I, I experienced a lot of uh, government uh, DOD projects where the uh, where the government never initiates any Title II services for the architect. And I think that's a big mistake because having the architect on site during construction administration and checking those things is absolutely crucial and critical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. I agree. But, you know, if they don't, then it just means we get more business, right? <laughs> I, yeah. I have, uh, there's, there's one question here from Nate Lawrence who says, do you see an issue with expansion of foam creating structural issues with building components? Um, I do if they're if it's not installed properly, like everything else. Um, I just want to make a point too that two component actually will um, exert less pressure than a one component. One component works under moisture, so it comes out like a squiggly worm, and then it expands. So you probably heard of one component uh, with issues of uh, windows bowing, like over the years, and then the manufacturers came out with a low expansion uh, window foam. Uh, which wasn't the best. It is getting a little bit better. Their, their formulations are a bit better, um, but it's it's the way you install it. So, you know, people used to install, say, the foam around a window system. You know, more is better. Fill up that whole cavity sort of thing. So what happens is because it comes out and works under moisture cure, the chemical in the center of that big bead is starving for moisture, so it starts to push out. And that's where you get those past post expansion pressures and window bowing and whatever else. So the proper way is, uh, I, I call it a two two bead apply approach, is to go in, do a small bead, you know, let it set, you know, 30 minutes, come back, do a second bead, and then you're off to the races. You're not going to get a lot of R value out of that. You're doing it more for an air barrier. Right. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I think uh, at this point, um, I want to thank you, uh, Steve. I, I, uh, I know we're we're uh, kind of uh, a little bit beyond where we normally are. Just five minutes, not bad. Uh, okay. I, I do want to thank you so much for your presentation today. It has been excellent. Uh, we've recorded this session, and of mm -hmm. course, it's uh, it, it will be available on our website. So. Uh, if there are any additional questions, as you see, uh, Steve's uh, email is, is shown here as well as mine. So please do not hesitate to uh, forward those to us.
And again, I want to thank you, Steve, for your uh, your great presentation today. Great. Well, thank you, thank you, for, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks. All righty. Great. And then, and then there is a, 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 a little note that we want to follow up on. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Bell Fabraro is on the line. Uh, Bell, we talked a little bit about the need for moderators for the the uh, Jetsi virtual uh, technical sessions. Um, Bell, do you want to uh, share any of your thoughts on that? We, I do have a couple of folks who have expressed an interest in uh, being moderators, including myself, by the way. But uh, what can you tell us? Well, thanks, Dave, and thanks to everyone for joining the call today. It's a great turnout. So. During the call, I did chat with Charles, who's actually filled the spot that we needed for the moderators. And Dave, you were um, suggested as a moderator by JJ and Ed to do their session. So I guess you're involved as well. <laughs> so we've actually filled all the moderator um, spots available for the architectural track. But we do need still for the en en energy tracks um, and it kind of is a crossover, so so some of you folks are interested in that. So we could share, if you're interested in moderating for our virtual JTC and you have virtual experience during webinars, which I'm sure most of you do, it would be fantastic to have you on board and to support us while we go through this new norm of a virtual platform. Wonderful. Um, and I'm, I will be uh, sharing the uh, message that you sent out. Um, I, I, I don't know if that went out to the entire membership, Bell, or did that uh, is that something that you just sent to the chairs? I just sent that to the chairs. The, the message I sent yesterday, yeah, yes. that just went yes. to guys. So, but feel free to forward it on. I, I will do that. All righty. Well, uh, any questions for Bell as far as the virtual Jetsi? Uh, technical sessions are concerned. Okay. We will right. be sending out, just to give everyone a heads up, sorry Dave, I just wanted to say we will be sending out a notification for everyone to go ahead and register. The prices are on the website and this is a perfect opportunity for those in need of PDH credits to gain those while they're actually um, on the virtual uh, JTC site. I know that right now there's a a restricted amount of folks that may be able to join us due to billable hours, etc. But we hope to have as much of an attendance as possible and be able to share some uh, information to you guys. Is, let me ask this question. Is there a cost associated with the technical sessions through this uh, virtual process? Mm -hmm. There is a cost, Dave, but those speakers that are listed and moderators get a full ride for the whole virtual event. Uh, it's, it's extremely discounted for government, but um, we understand that they also will have an issue to be able to claim um, the, the price for it. So we will um, sort of like undisclose, but we'll give them a code if, if they need to um, assess the code instead of that charging through their uh, government usual route. So okay. it's, a minimum, it's a minimum fee charged. Okay. All righty. Uh, Jim Pocock had asked what tracks are going, uh, what the tracks are going to be, but, but again, uh, I, Jim, I will send that out to you in terms of uh, what tracks are available and uh, what what the schedule for those sessions are. There's kind of a, a short list here of the architecture and engineering sessions. So, and also okay. on the website, they can also visit the SME JTC website. We have updated the sessions there, which ones are available virtually, and you can search by track. Excellent. All righty. Um, I will uh, take one minute here to uh, ensure there are no further questions. Uh, anybody else have any questions about anything that you've heard today about the, the, the community of interest, the webinar, or anything at all? Jetsy? Okay. All right, Bill, uh, thank you for joining us today. Tamel, I want to thank you for helping us uh, helping us through this session, uh, technical uh, session. Uh, and, and I want to thank everybody uh, and, and wish you all a, a safe uh, quarter as we, uh, as we proceed through. Our next session will be sometime uh, toward the end of July. 
and uh, enjoy the APC uh, quarterly journal. It's I think it's really a good one this year, this uh, quarter. So thank you so much for everything. Take care.